Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Khalil Jahshan. I'm Executive Director of Arab Center Washington. I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to this hybrid event today. It's our first hybrid event uh, in a long time. Uh, I guess uh, typically in Washington, a lot of people are still avoiding uh, in-person or face-to-face -face, uh, uh, events, but uh, we decided to uh, uh, kind of do a partial return to the old uh, days by uh, doing this hybrid event. In addition to the 50 or so of us here today, uh, there are a couple of hundred people actually right now live uh, watching us uh, virtually uh, on, on Zoom. So a special welcome to all of you out there uh, on Zoom worldwide. Uh, the audience is uh, mixed, of course, throughout the United States and Europe and the Middle East. Uh, so we're delighted uh, that you're with us today uh, to focus on a very important uh, uh, topic. And uh, so we, we will be doing kind of a, a couple of things uh, in addition, of course, to the briefing that we're going to have from uh, our colleague whom I will introduce uh, in a minute. Uh, we're going to have also Q&A uh, session so we can exchange some uh, views. Uh, those of you who are present here, uh, uh, you just raise your hand. I'll acknowledge you. You can go to the two microphones in the middle of the room, and you can ask your question personally. Uh, those of you on Zoom, you can uh, either uh, use the uh, feature, the Q&A feature on the Zoom page to send your questions, and, uh, or you could email uh, your uh, question to events at arabcenterdc.org, events at arabcenterdc.org. And your questions will be passed on to me. I'll read them on my iPad here, direct them appropriately, and, and try to cover as many of them as possible. Uh, the topic today is uh, the Arab Opinion Index. Uh, some of you are familiar, some of you are not. Uh, with the program uh, that our colleagues at Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies uh, in Doha uh, have been doing for several years. Uh, the Arab Opinion Index is an annual survey conducted by uh, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies in Doha, uh, Qatar, essentially to gauge public opinion in the Arab world around a number of uh, political, cultural, economic, and social issues that are of importance to those of us who cover uh, research-wise and media-wise uh, the, the Middle East. The index itself started in 2011. That was the first year. Uh, using a sample at the time, which was very impressive. At the time, I thought it was probably the tops. You know, We covered a sample of 16,000 respondents and uh, today, uh, that number has more than doubled, uh, a little bit more, and uh, our briefer will be uh, talking about that in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, we did cover 12 countries at the time, uh, which was uh, an achievement. Uh, frankly, uh, we try as much as possible uh, to include all Arab countries uh, in our surveys, but as you could tell, uh, it's a pretty complicated process in terms of securing the permission, the clearance, uh, the fact that we use local teams that have to be uh, uh, approved in a way and allowed uh, to do that. And some countries, uh, frankly, uh, public opinion polling has not proven to be successful or functional, uh, if, if you know what I mean, uh, whether it's face-to-face, -face, in person, or via uh, telephone. It hasn't been quite as reliable as some other countries because of the general political security environment, and other uh, issues that tend uh, to intrude. The project is managed by a team of our colleagues uh, in Doha uh, and in other countries, actually, uh, a team of uh, statisticians, pollsters, uh, research experts, regional experts, and, and so on, uh, with extensive, uh, I would say, expertise in survey methods. The survey is conducted in cooperation with local research and academic institutions uh, that cooperate with us. Uh, as you know, uh, some countries do not allow necessarily foreign teams uh, to come in uh, and do that. So most of our teams tend to be local uh, from uh, the countries uh, involved. And of course, our purpose is for that information that we end up with uh, so that it can be collected, analyzed, uh, published locally, 
uh, in regular reports in order to become available to the public in those countries, to researchers in those countries, and to decision makers uh, in those countries. That's essentially the purpose uh, of the uh, survey. So uh, the public, the Arab Opinion Index uh, essentially seeks to or aims uh, at identifying the current trends uh, in the Arab, uh, among Arab public, uh, public opinion, towards a range, as I said, of socio-political issues, including uh, things that are very dear to our own mission at not only, only Arab Center Washington, D.C., uh, but Arab centers worldwide. As you know, we are part of a network, uh, in addition to the Arab Center in Doha, which is our kind of flagship. Uh, we also have uh, Arab Center in Tunisia. Uh, we also have Arab Center in uh, Paris. And we are also affiliated with quite a few other uh, think tanks uh, in the uh, Arab world through cooperation and joint uh, projects. So issues pertaining to democracy, civil rights, governance, citizenship, equality, justice, the role of religion, uh, civic and political participation, political efficacy. These are all issues that are reflected in the questions uh, that we raise and in the results uh, that we uh, document. Uh, in addition, of course, to the major conflicts in the region. I mean, and, and it has been consistent uh, over the past, uh, let's say, uh, uh, years since 2011, uh, that we also focus particularly on the issue that most Arabs, uh, as our speaker will point out to you, consider as their cause, and not only the cause of the people who bear their, the, the, uh, whose name is attributed to the conflict, the Palestine uh, question, uh, where you have a predominant majority of Arabs see it as their issue. So it has figured pro prominently in uh, the survey. What we will be focusing on today, uh, uh, our speaker, our briefer, uh, will be uh, presenting to you some key results uh, from the 2022 uh, polls uh, finding. I hope you did pick up, as you entered uh, the room, an executive summary. If you haven't, make sure you pick one up uh, before you leave. There is an executive summary uh, of the uh, Arab Opinion Index 2022. Uh, that has uh, summaries of, and, and graphs of some of the major uh, results. There is also a bio of our speaker out there, and there is an excellent article that uh, she had uh, published uh, yesterday uh, in town uh, on some aspects uh, of, of the survey, survey that you will find very interesting. She will be focusing essentially on a few key questions. Uh, the survey is huge. We're not going to cover every aspect of the survey uh, this afternoon, otherwise we will keep you till 6 o'clock p.m., and I'm sure most of you would like to do something beyond <laughs> dealing with uh, Arab Opinion Index for all, the whole afternoon. So uh, we will be focusing on issues like, how do Arab citizens view democracy? Uh, uh, is it a welcome, uh, in, in a way, uh, development uh, in, in the minds of Arab citizenry in, in the Arab world? Do they yearn? for democratic rule in these countries, uh, that uh, 14 of them that we surveyed uh, this year. Are Arabs tired, as some analysts have claimed, of supporting the Palestinian cause, and that's why they are flocking for normalization. Is that substantiated by this public opinion survey? What, what do the Arab masses, if you will, normal citizens in the Arab world, what, what, how do they react to that? Uh, how do rank-and-file Arabs perceive uh, ongoing efforts at normalization, which was initially uh, started by the previous administration, uh, was opposed by the current administration at one point for about two minutes, and, and now seems to be central uh, to U.S. policy in the region for maybe lack of alternative or lack of a functional policy uh, in the region. You take your pick. And how do Arab citizens assess national security threats? They seem to have a different scale than we do uh, here in Washington, or uh, the, our government at least uh, does. Who is viewed by most Arabs as their national security threats? Is, does it differ from country to country? And uh, do assessments of US policy in the region differ from one Arab country uh, to, uh, to the other? Uh, is the resentment 
toward the U.S., quote, unquote, that is often referred to in the media? Is it really a resentment of the U.S. in general, or is it a resentment uh, of U.S. policy? To help us uh, kind of uh, decipher these and other questions, we are very delighted and, and uh, very honored uh, to have today our colleague, Dr. Dana Al-Kurd, with us. Uh, she is Assistant Professor of Political Science at uh, Richmond. And uh, Dana is a colleague, uh, spent uh, quite a few years uh, with us at Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies uh, in, in Doha. She plays a key role, uh, and, uh, or she did you know, play a key role in, in the Arab Index uh, while she was there. That was part of her uh, portfolio. She is the author of a well-known, uh, for those of you particularly who are interested in Palestinian issues, a well-known book that was published two years ago, 2020, entitled Polarized and Demobilized, Legacies of Authoritarianism in Palestine. Uh, she published many, many articles. That's why I uh, left uh, her bio at the front desk, if you'd like to, to pick that up. And uh, again, uh, welcome. Appreciate your presence here with us. Appreciate uh, the presence of uh, so many people with us online at this time. Uh, the microphone uh, is yours, uh, Dana. She will spend about 25 to 30 minutes uh, summarizing uh, the uh, survey for you, the Arab Opinion Index and then we will open the floor uh, for Q&A. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dana El-Kurd. Dana. Thank you, Dr. Khalil. Um, let's see if I can, am I tall enough for this? Um, all right, um, so yes, as Dr. Khalil uh, mentioned, um, I used to work at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies in Doha, Qatar, and I used to work on the Arab Opinion Index. Um, so I did not work on this particular wave, but they did send me the data, and so I have some familiarity with what's uh, involved in the process of collecting this data and things like this. Um, so today, let me find my clicker here. Um, as Dr. Khalid mentioned, I'll just be briefly um, looking over the, um, um, some key sections that to me are particularly interesting and I think to the kind of US policy world should be uh, interesting. Um, but as he mentioned, oh, sorry, is there an issue? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, yes, as expected, I was too short for the microphone. <laughs> um, all right. So starting off, just as I said, I'll give a brief introduction to the Arab Opinion Index, and then I'll give the three examples that were mentioned, I think, in the um, uh, executive summary. Um, I'm going to be looking specifically at the questions related to democracy. Um, as well as U.S. policy in certain uh, aspects, and then questions about Israel and Palestine, because I do believe that those three things are quite intertwined and are in, important um, in terms of today's foreign policy world. Um, so the Arab Opinion Index is, um, as he mentioned, a um, regional survey. It's been ongoing since 2011, so this is the eighth wave. Um, and it's, I think, quite unique in terms of regional surveys that exist. There have been a couple of different... Um, uh, projects, um, all, you know, um, quite rigorous in their own right. But what was particularly um, kind of the comparative advantage of the Arab Opinion Index is that it developed the battery of questions with kind of local expertise, um, with local partners and local researchers. Um, and they took with kind of the main assumption at being that Arab public opinion matters, that this is not something that, you know, we should uh, neglect. And if you look at from 2011 till today, the data that has been included um, kind of picked up on things that would become more relevant over time that at the beginning other regional surveys did not ask about, including the normalization question. Um, so um, I'll, I'll uh, reference some of those um, key differences as I, go, as I move forward. Um, so in terms of sampling, um, they, um, you know, depending on the wave, um, have a number of countries. In this particular wave, there are 14 countries, and as he mentioned, 33,000 some odd number of uh, respondents, so it's quite a lot. Um, but we try to make sure that um, each country sample is nationally representative, and we uh, uh, partner with, with local polling firms or research institutes to make sure that um, it's as rigorous as possible. Uh, in this particular wave, the Saudi sample was over the phone, so the 4,500 um, Saudi respondents were o via the phone for, I think, obvious reasons, but um, the remainder were face-to-face. -face. 
Um, but yeah, it, it sort of depends year by year which countries are going to be included, um, with some more consistent than others. Oh, I just said that part. <laughs> um, but it is in, you know, important to note that the countries included cover 85% of the Arab population, like overall population. So this is as, um, as representative as, as one gets with survey methodology. And these are the countries included in green. So the ones in yellow are not included. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I think this figure is, is present in the executive summary, but the, the numbers for each uh, sample are included as well, with the minimum being 1,500. OK, so field work was carried out by an overall team of 920 individuals. And we try to balance um, the enumerators based on gender so that we're not biasing um, any kind of results. Um, and they conducted, in this particular way, of 72,000 hours of face-to-face -face interviews. So the sections, um, as mentioned many times, there are so many sections to this. It's really such a rich uh, 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 source of data. Um, if you're interested in really in any kind of, <laughs> any topic, it's probably included in this. But I'm gonna focus on particular ones, though it does include living conditions of Arab citizens, so um, how much they can save what do they think of their economic conditions? Um, you know, do they want to immigrate? All of those kinds of like personal conditions questions are included in addition to the demographic ones so that if a researcher were to take this data and want to do regression analysis and not just focus on descriptive statistics, you can do that as well. Um, as well as perception of state institutions. So we ask, you know, uh, obviously depending on the country, we ask things like trust in the military, trust in the parliament, trust in those kinds of things. Um, and we do take into consideration also kind of the authoritarian context of many of these places. So we have in the past used experimental methods to try to get at uh, questions in more indirect ways. Um, obviously, we, uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to go over the attitudes towards, attitudes towards democracy. Um, we also have measures of civic and political participation. Uh, so membership in political parties, how much do you protest, how much do you, all those things, um, as well as kind of opinions about intra-Arab relations as well as foreign relations and foreign policy. And finally, there is a section on religion and politics. I, I won't be covering that today, but if it's there if you, if you want to look at it. OK, so beginning with the democracy question. So the survey asks about democracy in a number of different ways. We don't just ask, like, do you like democracy? Like, the, we try to get at it in different ways, because these are questions of survey methodology. We want to try to make sure that we're the kind of underlying concept um, of democracy is, is being assessed, um, rather than maybe the baggage around democracy, let's say. Um, so we ask about democracy directly, but we also ask about different components of democracy, like would you accept um, uh, you know, a political party that you didn't like coming into power? So like all, all sorts of different ways to ga uh, gauge um, kind of democratic norms and how respondents perceive democracy as well. So how much do they perceive their own situation as being democratic or not? And that actually results in some very interesting uh, trends. So um, this is um, from this year's wave. We give a battery of statements, um, and we ask them to agree or disagree with, with, with those battery of statements. Generally speaking, these are mostly or all negative. Um, there's um, you know, not a lot of support for negative perceptions of democracy. So Arabs don't agree, for example, that democracy is incompatible with Islam. They don't agree that economic performance suffers uniquely under democracy. So all of these situations, all of these statements, kind of get at different, you know, possible critiques that we hear um, about about the democratic, you know, uh, uh, governance. And Arabs don't necessarily attribute that to democracy as a concept. Um, where we do see some um, more support, um, but still a minority support um, for. Um, uh, a negative statement, let's say, is the statement, my society is unprepared for democracy. Um, and that has, uh, if you look at this particular question over time, that has kind of ticked upward in the last couple of years. So there is maybe, we can say, a separation between the democracy as a concept for Arab citizens and the lived experience of democracy. They might think that, oh, you know, given the situation post-Arab Spring, um, I don't think society might be prepared for democracy, but there's nothing wrong inherently with a democratic governance. Um, and so the democracy is the best system. That's another statement that we ask them to, to um, agree or disagree with. Um, that has been pretty consistent across the waves of the survey. So from 2011 to 2022, we have a majority that say they strongly agree or agree that democracy is the best system of governance. In this last one, it's 72%. Um, either agree or strongly agree. So again, 
quite a lot of support for democracy as a system of governance um, because it does imply accountability and protections uh, in, in, uh, you know, from government overreach. And this is um, the same question, the same statement by regional comparison. So in this, in this wave and in the previous wave, we started to look at kind of subregions in the Arab world to try to gauge like, you know, how different parts of the Arab world uh, feel about this. Um, so we've split it up into Al Maghreb, uh, the North African region, the Nile Valley, uh, Al Mashriq, the Levant, and the Gulf. Um, again, in all of these uh, places, there is a majority support for the idea that democracy is the best system of governance, though we do see, of course, uh, um, a slightly higher rate of non-response in the Gulf uh, region. Um, the Gulf countries included in this year's uh, survey were Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. And actually, that, that kind of makes sense, because in two of those countries, there's no democracy, and in one of those countries, they have a very gridlocked democracy, so it m makes sense there, but still, a majority support this statement. Okay, so moving on to US policy. Um, this is not a great image, but I will explain it. Um, so we ask over, you know, since 2016, we've asked a, a, a consistent question about which of these countries do you um, agree poses a threat to the region, poses a source of ins insecurity and instability in the region. And we ask across um, a couple of different countries. So Turkey, China, France, Russia, Iran, the United States, and Israel. Um, and what we see are, in some cases, pretty consistent results across time. And in other cases, there have been some improvements in, let's say, a country's image. Um, Israel, um, when, when asked this question about Israel, um, you know, 84% of the Arab population say that um, it poses a, a risk to uh, insecurity um, and instability in the region. Um, the next runner-up is the United States. So 78% um, say that um, the United States poses a, a threat of uh, you know, security, um, sorry, uh, poses insecurity and instability in the region. Um, now, when you look at the United States or Israel over time, it's pretty consistent. But in, if you look at, say, Iran or Russia from 2016 to 2022, you know, over the years of this, of this survey, um, there have been improvements in Iran's image, for example, or Russia's image. And I mean, I don't need to necessarily tell the people in this room, but like, uh, you know, that's maybe not um, matching up to reality of the, the policies that uh, these two countries uh, engage in in the region, and yet they still fare much better than the United States. So yeah, as I said, just a summary here, 78% agree that the US, pol US policy poses a source of threat and instability in the region compared to 57% in Russia and 57% um, for Iran. And there is a general sense, I would say, of American hypocrisy on uh, Middle East policy. Um, so I would say particularly under this administration and a lot of the kind of pro-democracy rhetoric that we're hearing and, and uh, you know, the admirable position they've taken, um, in my opinion, towards uh, the uh, invasion of Ukraine, but there is a sense that there is a Middle East exception to this administration's pro-democracy uh, uh, um, position. Um, additionally, the United, the United States um, in the last couple of years have been, you know, has been supporting human rights violators, um, even when it <laughs> impacts American citizens. So there was a recent um, report that was published about um, particularly how Egyptian Americans, for example, are impacted by El Sisi's uh, um, uh, policies and how the American establishment has not really um, risen to the occasion, as well as the support for the Abraham Accords. I think that this is a key kind of node in um, Arab uh, dissatisfaction with American foreign policy that we'll get to um, in, in the next couple of slides here. Okay, so on the question of Palestine, on the question of normalization, given what I just showed you, you know, keeping, it, keeping that in mind. So to begin with, as uh, Dr. Khadin mentioned, attitudes towards the Palestinian cause are overwhelmingly supportive. Arabs um, view the Palestinian cause as a concern of all Arabs, not just Palestinians alone. And that, again, has been quite consistent since we started asking this question in 2011. There has been a slight dip from 84% in 2011 to 76% in 2022, but still three quarters of the Arab population surveyed are you know, supportive of the, of the Palestinian cause and, and um, believe it is a cause of concern for all Arabs. And this, again, when we look at questions across the survey and look at questions that might be kind of ideologically consistent is very consistent. So when we ask about Arab unity, for example, that um, all Arabs constitute a single nation and we're not, you know, uh, have, uh, um, can, you know, similar trajectories and all of those things. Again, that is a very consistent question across time, and that most Arabs agree that um, Arab 
peoples constitute a single nation, um, whether they agree very strongly or agree somewhat, they do agree that there is a shared kind of history and a, and a shared cause of concern. So that explains the Palestine question. And this is the same question by region. Um, interestingly, in the Levant is the highest uh, kind of uh, um, disagreement rate with that statement. Um, so we're talking the countries of, in this particular wave, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Palestine. I think that, you know, that also makes some degree of sense because they are um, under the most direct conflict um, that, that results, as, uh, th that results um, because of Israeli policy. So it kind of makes sense there, but generally speaking, majorities agree with this sentiment. And then when we get to the question on diplomatic relations with Israel, Again, very consistent with the previous questions that, that are related. Um, in this last wave, this is across all the countries included in the last wave, um, the majorities you know, oppose diplomatic relations with Israel. We have a huge non-response rate in Saudi Arabia at 57%. Um, when I was working at the Arab Opinion Index, we had a slightly smaller non-response rate, but still much larger than the other samples. And we did experimental um, analysis to um, kind of get at like why are people um, worried about responding to this question. And it, and it is, you know, they didn't, um, they didn't do it in this time around, but it, the last time that they did the experimental results, um, it's, it's very clear that people are worried about giving their actual opinion about the Palestinian question um, in Saudi Arabia, which is why we have that kind of large uh, uh, non-response rate. Um, but, you know, only 5% say they fully support diplomatic recognition, even in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I'm mentioning Saudi Arabia because it was in the news this morning <laughs> about Israeli and Saudi normalization. Um, and then generally speaking, there are only you know, small minorities across these countries. Sudan and Morocco, two countries that have recently signed on to the Abraham Accords, do have an increase in support for diplomatic relations with Israel. But we can see that as kind of a cause and effect. Like they just signed these agreements, and especially in a, in a context like Morocco or Sudan, where they don't have uh, uh, you know, democratic governance or protections, there might be some, um, uh, some, some effect on uh, response bias there. Oh, okay, did it move? Yes. Um, okay, so yes, as I said, um, the, the, on this question, a lot of consistency over time. We actually don't see a lot of change since 2011. We have the same numbers in some cases. So in 2011, 84% rejected diplomatic recognition with Israel. Same in 2022. So this has been a pretty consistent um, uh, um, uh, position for Arab publics that I don't think people have taken into consideration as much. And I want to linger on this point a little bit because, um, yeah, sorry, this is by region. So this is in the Levant, the Maghreb, the Nile Valley, the Gulf, and the aggregate number again for this, for this year. Again, we have the, because of the large non-response rate in Saudi, we have a 22% non-response rate in the entire Gulf. But generally speaking, still 84% reject dipl diplomatic relations with Israel. So as I said, I want to linger on this point a little bit because when I used to present this data, whether it's like to these kinds of audiences or even in academic audiences, um, one, people would think that it's not that important of a question to ask, but now that, you know, with the Abraham Accords, I'm hoping we see the, the importance and relevance of this question. But also they would, um, they would be a little bit maybe surprised at the level of dissatisfaction with normalization. Um, or they might question, like, is it truly, you know, 84% reject diplomatic recognition? And so I put together kind of the latest uh, survey results from a number of different regional surveys. The Arab Opinion Index is the only one that has been asking this question since 2011. Um, but there are a couple of different um, projects that have since asked this question. So in the Arab Barometer, for example, in their last wave, they also find only 13% of the, of the countries polled, or sorry, the respondents polled, um, approve of diplomatic relations with Israel. So again, still a minority. Um, the, Arab Barometer, sorry, the Arab Barometer does not poll in the Gulf um, for their latest wave, but they do, I think, include Morocco. Um, but still, they, they find a very small minority are um, uh, supporting diplomatic recognition of Israel. And we find 8% approval, so still quite a minority. Now, it's, to be clear, we did not poll in Bahrain or the UAE. Um, but we do poll in Morocco and Sudan. And then there was also the Washington Institute for Near East, Near East Policy that conducted uh, a poll um, in the UAE and Bahrain, though 
to be frank, the data collection is quite unclear, so I don't really, I can't really comment on the sampling method. Um, but even they find that only 25% of their respondents in these two countries see the effects of the agreement in the region as a somewhat positive thing. Um, so still quite a minority um, uh, support even in the countries that they uh, supposedly ran this, this survey. Um, but of course we have to take it you know, with a grain of salt that even that 25% might be inflated given the con you know, political conditions in these two countries. Okay, so then when we ask follow-up questions about like why do you refuse diplomatic recognition or if you support it, why do you support it? Um, the majority that oppose diplomatic ties between their country and Israel highlighted factors such as the ongoing occupation, Israeli racism towards Palestinians, its expansionist policies. Very few people mentioned things in any kind of religious terms. Um, there was a minority of respondents who also named Israeli racism towards Arabs or regional instability, but for most Arabs responding, you know, the answer is very clear. We oppose is diplomatic recognition because of ongoing occupation. It's just quite a, a clear cause and effect. Um, and then for those who, you know, the minority who do support um, diplomatic recognition of Israel, their reasons were actually much more nuanced than you know, you'd expect. So in a similar kind of open-ended question, half of that minority group um, made recognition of Israel conditional on the formation of an independent Palestinian state. So even amongst people who say, yeah, we support diplomatic recognition of Israel if there is some movement on the two-state solution. So in both groups, political reasons are really the most salient um, and explain these, these opinions much more so than, um, you know, any kind of, the kind of talking points we see in the media about like religious uh, animosity or anything like that. Okay, so then when we get to the question on U.S. policy in Palestine, it helps to explain the, explain the um, uh, partly the uh, initial question on U.S. policy generally and dissatisfaction with U.S. policy. Um, across the subregions, there is a huge dissatisfaction with U.S. policy on Palestine specifically. So that's the case, whether it's in the Gulf, Nile Valley, Maghreb, Levant. Again, we have the high non-response rate in the Gulf, but um, still uh, only a, a little bit of... Uh, only a few respondents see any kind of um, U.S. policy in a positive light. But when you compare, I'm just going to flip through that again, when you compare U.S. policy to Russian policy towards Palestine, there are, you know, kind of huge shifts, um, uh, statistically speaking. Um, US, pol U.S. policy fares much more poorly uh, in comparison to Russian policy on Palestine and in comparison to Iranian policy on Palestine. So. You know, that doesn't fully explain the dissatisfaction with all of, all of U.S. policy, or all of Iranian policy that I showed earlier, but it is a crucial aspect of it. So um, in conclusion, um, the Arab Opinion Index, as I said, the, its comparative advantage is really creating measures that capture these kind of underlying persistent problems or persistent issues in the Arab world using our highly contextualized knowledge of the cases. I mean, I think it says a lot about the Arab Opinion Index that we've been asking these questions about Palestine and diplomatic recognition of Israel since 2011, whereas you know, other surveys asked it just in their latest waves or just very recently. Um, so we do have the consistency of data. You can look at these trends over time, and it's really such a val uh, valuable resource in that, in that sense, and hopefully to either help inform policy or other uh, research, um, uh, you, you can use the, um, the Arab Opinion Index reports or the um, uh, online interactive tool. And thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate uh, your uh, s very effective summary of some of the key <laughs> uh, points uh, that are of importance uh, to all of us who are interested in public opinion, uh, which has not always been the focus of attention, uh, somehow still, at least uh, as a reflection of U.S. policy, it seems as a country we continue to focus on the official position. After all, governments deal with governments is the justification. Uh, but uh, particularly for countries that pride themselves on support for democracy, it behooves them uh, to look at public opinion in, in crucial uh, or in countries of important uh, value, strategic value uh, to the United States, to look at what the public really wants uh, and where it stands uh, on, on these issues. I don't see that. I mean, as, as an ancient observer, <laughs> 
of U.S. foreign policy uh, going back to my undergrad days, uh, half a century ago, uh, I, I still do not see Arab public opinion as being factored in seriously uh, in U.S. foreign policy or other foreign policy for that matter, maybe a little bit better on the part of uh, the EU uh, because of the closer proximity and the historical connection with, with the region, uh, but still, uh, government to government uh, seem uh, to be the prevalent uh, attitude. Uh, the, the other kind of, uh, that what strikes me in the face every year we do this uh, 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 survey uh, is the, um, the big gap, the big gap that exists between Arab public opinion and Arab public policy itself. It's, the contradiction is not just with the US. There is internal contradictions uh, in the region. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine, a senior retired U.S. diplomat, commented on your article, which I tweeted yesterday, okay. um, by telling me that, well, you guys are blaming the U.S. too much, you and I, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that uh, the, most of the blame should be on the Arabs, on the Arab governments. They need to lead the battle. Of course, democracy would be more authentic and will not pick up in the region if the Arabs uh, do not uh, pick that up as, as a national uh, objective. But considering the, uh, the limited capacity of, of the Arab masses to impact for their, their policies in their country, even though they're trying and they would like to, but they still tell us about the, the uh, limited access uh, in these uh, uh, results. And the fact that we put all of our weight on the side of the uh, authoritarian axis uh, that uh, we support and we describe as our allies in the region who cannot, by definition, be supportive of democracy because it's the antithesis uh, to their form of government and, and they would lose control uh, of, of governance uh, in their country. So that, that gap strikes me still as a student of the Middle East as an observer of U.S. policy in the Middle East as a, as a very uh, important thing. Uh, a key in point, for example, uh, I think uh, yesterday uh, uh, the foreign minister uh, of Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Faisal uh, bin Farhan, uh, urged actually uh, the, the leaders in Israel, assuming the new government, uh, to be a bit more responsive to the search for peace with the Palestinians. I mean, you know, that's well taken, fine, but we just heard what, what this government, uh, as reflected in this public opinion, why are Arabs objecting to relationship and recognition of that uh, country? Particularly, I have a feeling the numbers are gonna go sky high once these policies of this particular government uh, are going to be, you know, implemented. And, and become uh, public. I, I, I'm, I'm predicting, I don't know, I hope I'm right, uh, but we'll see next year uh, when we do the survey whether the numbers uh, pick up. But, um, you know, it's good to hear uh, foreign ministers uh, in, in some of these countries like uh, uh, Ben Farhan uh, raise this issue, but, uh, you know, uh, is it possible is it possible? Are, are they kind of totally uh, uh, excluded, uh, if you will, or isolated from the realities that are unfolding in the region around them? Who knows? So the, the final point I'd like to make, uh, and it, it, it's illustrated every time we do uh, the survey, is that a lot of people, because of media coverage over the years, somehow, I mean, there is always some reference in all kinds news coverage on a daily basis shows there's always anger in the Arab world, there is always resentment in the Arab world, and somehow it, it gets sometimes construed or misconstrued as antagonism or hatred for the United States. It's not. The public makes it very clear. It's almost a love-hate relationship that's reflected in these results. Love for America, willing to immigrate to America for those who are frustrated with their economic situation, but hatred for U.S. foreign policy, which they view uh, as lacking uh, both morally and, and uh, politically. So uh, with that said, I'll open the floor 
uh, for questions. Bill, would you go ahead to the uh, microphone there, please, so that uh, the audience uh, online can hear you. Uh, identify yourself, please, and, and affiliation if you want to, and, and raise your question, please. Um, so, uh, hello, uh, Bill Lawrence, American University. Uh, two questions, um, uh, but first, just congratulations uh, uh, to those listening <laughs> who were involved in the production of the poll and to the Arab Center for this event. I, I feel coming here each year now for several years to this event, it's sort of like getting a booster shot, you know, sort of reality check on, on how the Arab world is seeing us and seeing these foreign policy issues because <clears throat> as you didn't really get into, but Khalil was starting to suggest, um, American views of Arabs and Muslims is so politicized that we need to sort of be, have a depoliticization of the American regard, and this, this poll is part of that um, uh, uh, successful effort by the Arab Center in, in, in a number of ways to depoliticize that, that view. Um, which leads me to my first question. Now this is not a, intended to criticize the poll or, or reveal some flaw in it, but more as just a researcher who spends a lot of time overseas trying to do interviews and you know, I was wondering um, uh, where you would like to see more progress uh, when you were working there and in general in terms of who you can poll and are there difficulties with older populations, younger populations, more or less educated, regional disparities. I have a good understanding of what countries you work in and why, but I'm thinking more like within the countries, where do we need to still make progress in getting um, potential respondents to respond to polls and uh, 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 to improve the data. And my second question is about Ukraine, uh, which you didn't get into, but I found those results really interesting and the way they're sort of unpredictable in terms of which populations were more, let's say, opposed to the Russian invasion or not. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the Ukraine um, slide. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so in terms of your first question about the, um, sorry, I'm trying to position myself here. Um, in terms of like, what I would have liked to see moving forward in the poll. Um, hopefully they're, they're listening right now though. <laughs> um, because I, don't, I no longer work on the poll. But um, I really think that the um, indirect questions and the kind of experimental analysis was really valuable, um, the, the, the wave or two that we did it. Um, so that's basically like asking a sensitive question without making the respondent specify um, you know exactly what his answer is, but noting differences across the, you know uh, different parts of the sample, um, and in that way, kind of asking the sensitive question without asking it. And I think that um, taking that into consideration more and expanding on those kinds of questions across kind of authoritarian contexts would be really valuable. Um, additionally, I think the expansion of phone surveys is is um, is you know the next step um, because of the use of phone surveys. We were they were able to do when I was there in Saudi Arabia, they've continued to do it in Saudi Arabia, but we can you know, think of how to reach other countries um, and, and, and other populations through phone surveys or maybe through third parties. Um, in terms of in like kind of sub, sub-national uh, variation, so because of the kind of sampling frame, they do try to balance the sample. Like let's say in Egypt, we know that, I don't know, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but let's say 40% are rural. So they try to make sure that 40% of that sample is rural. Um, so they, I, I think they do a pretty good job with, with, the, with the sampling frame. But yeah, from my perspective, as also somebody who uses a lot of survey data in like my own research, like I, would, I would like to see it go in that front. Um, on the Ukraine question, I'll, I'll, I'll let Dr. Khadid answer as well, but um, I did note that there was a lot of non-response there and like a lot of like I don't knows um, across the different countries. Um, so it seems like I mean, this is anecdotal completely just from like my view of like the Palestinian sample. Like there's not a lot of maybe care <laughs> um, about, uh, you know, uh, the Russian invasion necessarily or American foreign policy towards it. But, but yeah, I don't know, your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I know, I, I agree. I think there is a bit of embarrassment uh, in public opinion vis-a-vis uh, -vis the issue of Ukraine. Definitely that the sympathy is with the Ukrainian people. Uh, what were the difficulty, I mean, we haven't polled, but I'm, I'm just, my analysis based on my 50 year experience with the region, uh, countries that are close to Russia right now, I, I see their population as kind of divided, torn. Can they express their uh, feelings freely or not? Uh, countries that are uh, suggesting themselves as potential mediators in Ukraine, uh, their citizens are, seem to be taking permission 
from that to say a few more words. Uh, but the public uh, that is so, as you could tell, animated against occupation is not going to be so animated in support of vicious milit militant and violent occupation of Ukraine. Uh, so the public is, is still, I mean, we are right in the middle and early stages of that conflict. So Arab opinion could become clearer and more vocal uh, down the road. But at this time, I would describe it as somewhat still confused uh, on the issue. Uh, let me uh, take a question from our uh, uh, Zoom uh, audience. Uh, thank you, Hassan al-Shawaf, uh, for being with us and for uh, raising this important question, which is a bit related uh, in a way, but a different population, uh, to what Bill raised. Were ethnic minorities excluded in the sample of 33,300? For example, how about the Kurds in Iraq? Were they included? So ethnic minorities in any of these countries are not excluded. Um, I think that there are um, checks in the Gulf countries to double check citizenship, so you're not polling expats or migrant labor, but you know, ethnic minorities who are citizens of their countries are included in these polls. So the Kurds in Iraq are included in these polls. Uh, there is a question from another uh, a friend uh, on uh, online, uh, Aida Abdul Rahim. Thank you, Aida, for your question. Uh, she's basically asking uh, an environmental uh, question, which I, I don't think we we still cover fully yeah, I don't think so. uh, at all, actually. Uh, in, in the Arab Opinion Index. Uh, she was wondering uh, if uh, we ask, uh, if we tackle, the way she put it, how the Arab world viewed water security and the environment as reasons for migration. Um, I, I don't think migration we ask Migration in general, yes. We do not, ask about migration, no. yeah. We ask about like um, motivations for migration and I think it's like under the kind of general framing of political insecurity or economic conditions. I don't think we ask specifically about the environment, but we do ask about um, services. We do ask about state services, so I, water is included in that. Um, uh, but, but yeah, there's not a specific question about the environment. Perhaps that's something that should be taken into consideration for the next wave, yeah. Okay, I'm not ignoring you guys in the room. If you would like to uh, ask a question, just raise your hand, I'll acknowledge you. And you can use the, the microphone, Dr. Abdul Wahab, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Dana, for the uh, educative presentation. I just want to uh, ask about uh, how the Kurds in Iraq behave in this time, because um, I've seen the um, you know, previous uh, uh, opinions. They were about 85% uh, comes uh, with the overall Arab uh, you know, point of view. So I hadn't seen uh, now how the Kurds behaved in this. Thank you. Um, I'm really sorry, I don't have the data off the top of my head in terms of like how the Kurdish population in particular in Iraq. I'm assuming you're talking about the Palestine question? Or, or, or in general. Or in general. In general. general. Yeah, I'm, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that off the top of my head. Um, I don't, yeah. So they didn't differ very much. Hmm. That's, a, yeah. that's an interesting question. I think that's a that's a valid question. Um, I'll have to look into it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, for the benefit of everyone, uh, everyone here and uh, online, uh, the results, uh, the executive summary is online. Uh, so if you want to uh, pursue some of these and take a look again uh, at those tables, so is the presentation that was uh, uh, aired live and will be also posted uh, on all our uh, social media and on our website. Uh, in addition to uh, more detailed raw data, definitely way beyond our executive sum summary that is also already posted on the website of Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies in Arabic in, in, uh, in Doha. Uh, the next uh, question, uh, Carl uh, Goldberg, uh, thank you for your question. Carl is asking, how do the respondents understand democracy? Uh, is it the same way that America understands democracy that is based on the American Constitution? 
Definitely not the American Constitution, Carl, but I'm sure they have their own vision of a Constitution that's relevant to them. But go ahead. Yeah, so when we write these questions, like when we're trying to gauge a concept like democracy or any other concept like security or something like this, we try to take into consideration kind of the academic debates about like what that concept constitutes. Um, so there are, you know, a certain, um, definitions of democracy that are very uh, minimalist, you know, related to kind of turnover or elections or voting, and there are more expansive uh, um, definitions of democracy that include like safeguards and political rights and civil liberties. And that's why you see the many questions about democracy in this survey. We're trying to get at all the different definitions because we presume like in a region this size um, and in lots of countries that don't have kind of experience with the democratic process that they might understand democracy differently. And so if you are interested in democracy as a, as, you know, a, a system of governance that safeguards political rights, you have the questions to see how Arabs think of it that way. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that fully answered the question, but I feel like we get at different definitions of democracy in this, in this survey. Uh, another question came uh, from our uh, Zoom uh, audience, Anne Moisen, thank you for your uh, question. Uh, Anne asks, what impact, if any, did your interviewers see in effective misinformation or disinformation campaigns, often led by autocratic leaders, as we all know, have in impacting the results of the survey among the public? So there's like a couple of embedded questions in that. I think generally speaking, we understand that these survey results are not just the Arab Opinion Index, any kind of surveys that you conduct, um, particularly in autocratic settings, will have certain types of response bias. And so whether it's you, you account for that using various iterations of the question, experimental questions, or you know, your case specific knowledge of, of, of that case. So you understand why you see a jump, for example, on the normalization question in a place like Morocco from year to year. Um, you take that into consideration with your analysis. Um, in terms of misinformation specifically, I don't think that we ask a question about misinformation. At least we didn't ask a question about misinformation in the waves that I worked on. I'm not sure about this wave. Um, but um, we do have a lot, there's a whole section about where people get their sources of information and where they're getting their news. And what, what I did actually note in this particular wave of the index is um, a huge jump in who gets their news on the internet whereas that has been mostly on t in TV over uh, the last couple of waves. Um, and then when you break that down, you know, what kind of news on the internet, it's mostly Facebook and WhatsApp. And so that would be, you know, again, if you asked about like expanding the survey, like that would be a fascinating expansion to be like, what kinds of news are people consuming on the internet in increasing numbers, particularly via Facebook and WhatsApp, given what we know about those, those companies. Um, but yeah, a specific question about misinformation, we don't have. Uh, may I uh, ask you uh, a question, Dana? In terms of the uh, samples, can you tell us, uh, I mean, Arab countries, uh, particularly the 14 that, that we have dealt with this time, uh, come in different sizes. Mm -hmm. I mean, talking about Egypt and on the one hand, let's say, and Qatar on, on the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, samples in each country, the distribution? Uh, in, in, in these countries, for example, that we uh, mentioned, right. and, and how that impacts with the, the results in a way. How do we balance uh, so, the results? Yeah, so when you have like a very long survey, um, which this is, I think it takes something like 45 minutes to get through an interview, um, you need, and, and you have a lot of like questions of interest, you need a large enough sample so that you're, you don't, you know, un, uh, unintentionally induce some sort of bias or like, you know, extrapolate from smaller groups of people. Um, so that's why you see like a minimum in, in a lot of these countries that's like 1,500, 1,800, even in the smallest countries, even in, in you know, a country like Kuwait or Qatar, you have the 1,800 minimum because just so many survey uh, uh, tools in, uh, included in this particular wave. Um, there are some other, um, other samples, like for example, the Saudi sample, as I said, it's 4,500 people. Um, that has to do with making sure we get enough people answering each question um, because this was a phone, phone survey, right? So that, in, you know, that includes or injects a bunch of noise in, in, uh, in, in the survey process. Um, as I said earlier, within each country, we try to do probability proportional to size sampling. And so in a country like Egypt, if it's a particular rate of urbanization we know of, 
we make sure that the, you know, the sample reflects those kinds of breakdowns. Um, the sample is gender balanced. Uh, the sample does come from each province, for example. Um, we do that from the smallest countries to the biggest countries. Um, so that is, you know, something to be, to, to keep in mind when you're looking at this data in aggregate, is that it does kind of um, maybe oversample um, just in aggregate numbers from certain countries and others. And that's not because we're trying to make like the Kuwaiti opinion matter more necessarily. It's just because the survey is so big to do this correctly. You need a lot of respondents, um, even from the smallest countries. Um, so that's why also the, the kind of the data analysis process, which this, this does uh, lend itself to, should move beyond descriptive statistics and should you know, include kind of regression analysis and more um, rigorous study, which I've done some, to some degree, uh, in, in previous years, yeah. Yeah, by the way, in terms of the samples, just, I, I think you uh, probably saw, it. or yeah, you skipped it, but uh, uh, the largest, I think, uh, by country uh, sampling was Saudi Arabia with, with uh, 4,500 uh, out of the 33,300, the, the overall uh, sample. The smallest one was uh, Qatar with 12, 1,200. So, but the average uh, country poll like this time was, about 2,000, yeah, right? 18 to 200. 200 18 yeah. to 2,000. Uh, so it's, it's uh, equally divided. I mean, I think uh, probably nine of the 14 are at 2,400, the same uh, across the board. Uh, I do have a question somewhat related. Uh, is uh, Travis, thank you for your question. Uh, some countries not surveyed uh, made sense. Uh, I assume you refer to uh, countries with security problems, like at war, let's say it's not safe. Uh, to go into some countries today and do public opinion surveys and put your team uh, at uh, danger. But uh, you mentioned Oman uh, and the UAE kind of stood out. And uh, you're asking, can you expound uh, a little why? Uh, and the comment about uh, Arab opinion of US foreign policy, does, Arab, does the Arab world think that Americans believe that American public opinion should be a factor in Arab states' uh, foreign policy? Let's yeah. start with the first bit. <laughs> let's um, start with the first one. Yeah, Why first Oman bit. and the UAE are not included? I mean, th that's a couple of reasons, right? Like, you make those decisions with local partners. Um, so if there is a polling firm in a particular country, not specifically those two, that's willing to work with the Arab Center and, like, understands kind of the political cost that that might have for them, um, then we do that. And then in other places, there isn't a... There isn't a regional um, partner that might work with us um, for a variety of reasons, or we don't want to put people at risk who are answering these questions. In a place like the UAE, I think that makes perfect sense, um, or even in Oman, frankly. Um, so, you know, that has to do with both the enumerators on one side as well as the respondents on another. We don't want to put people at risk, or we don't have like a, you know, a quality partner in those places. Um, which is why when I mentioned the Washington Institute and their poll in the UAE and Bahrain, I was like quite surprised and dubious of the results. Um, but yeah, so I think that answers that question. Yeah, the second it does. Question, yeah, the second was uh, in terms of the reciprocity, <laughs> yeah. So do Arab they think, public opinion, you know, wants to factor in. Oh, so, do, do yeah. they, do, should, do Arabs believe American public opinion should factor in? Okay, so in previous waves of this survey, like, I'm gonna try to answer based on survey results. In previous waves of the survey, we had questions about like, what do you think of American people? And people had generally positive views. So we don't, a we don't ask a question, how much do you think American public opinion should factor into Arab policy um, directly? But I imagine most Arabs, since they view Americans positively, wouldn't mind that so much. <laughs> yeah. Um I mean, it, it depends, uh, frankly, how, how you look at it. Uh, no country is perfect in this sense. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that we have, Americans, have reached uh, a point of uh, perfection in terms of our foreign policy reflecting our public opinion. Uh, I don't think it does in, in many, many uh, respects. But uh, generally speaking, uh, an administration that tries to ignore or buck, if you will, uh, totally ignore uh, public opinion uh, ends up getting in trouble if not early on in its policy maybe later on in its policy and we can as students of foreign policy 
We can all remember instances like that, uh, from major events like the Vietnam War uh, to minor events uh, right now. I mean, uh, even emerging problems like in uh, our uh, foreign policy in the Middle East right now, particularly with Israel and normalization. Uh, the public is uh, heading in one direction, our, our policy is heading in, uh, in another, particularly in, with regards to specific age groups and specific parties. And that's why the president is having a hard time uh, justifying, and that's why his national security advisor right now is carrying in, in, the, in the region in Israel to try to calm things down because he feels like uh, the president uh, is having a hard time uh, maintaining his traditional uh, inherited from his grandfather or wh whoever he blames it on, uh, position on Israel as to uh, why it should be kept. Uh, uh, because people in the party, particularly young people, uh, when 40 percent, for God's sake, of youth in the American Jewish community that tends to be majority uh, uh, Democrats are basically saying, uh, uh, you know, one thing, and, and the president can't, can't identify even with that uh, with regards to apartheid, for example, or apartheid-like behavior uh, by the Israelis vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Uh, so nobody respects 100% uh, their, their public opinion, but a democracy needs to, needs to, uh, to some extent or another, needs to be uh, responsive to that. Um, William Gant, thank you for your question. Uh, William asks, looking at the numbers regarding normalization with Israel, how can the Israeli government claim that their relations with Arab countries are improving when the numbers show a different picture? Do they not read polls in West Jerusalem? I guess some of them do not, just like in uh, Pennsylvania, on Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue, but we do share that, by the way. Uh, I make sure that these results are shared by some of the key people in our foreign policy uh, establishment here uh, in town. But whether they do in West Jerusalem or not, the issue is not really whether they do or not, I assure you. Guess yeah. what? The first article written about this year's results was in an Israeli paper. The Jerusalem Post picked up the tables the first day, and they put one after the other. And they're not necessarily an, uh, a liberal or open-minded uh, uh, newspaper, uh, I mean, Haaretz might be, uh, Haaretz coverage might be uh, slightly more critical uh, of the government there, but not the Jerusalem Post necessarily. A couple of writers in it do, uh, but uh, they picked up the issue immediately. The, fir the same day we put the results on the website, and uh, we appreciated that, and it's good uh, that uh, they see it, but they, they don't seem to be bothered by it, at, at least not having known uh, some of the figures in the current government, including Netanyahu, having debated Mr. Netanyahu personally many years ago, I, I don't think he's necessarily impressed by this. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, just look at the person he just picked last night uh, to be his emissary to some of these authoritarian governments that he wants to normalize with. Uh, one of the ugliest intelligence officers in, in the service of the Israeli government who's well known for his hatred and his violence uh, toward Arabs and Muslims, and, and he's in charge of normalizing with the others who haven't normalized yet. I mean, it's like PR. Uh, they are in la la land uh, on, 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 on this issue. So I'm, I'm sorry to say, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I think that they know, and I, I don't, I think the difference is that they don't, you know, they don't care. They mm -hmm. don't care what Arab public opinion is for a couple of reasons. One is that they are building these alliances and presume that they can continue to control the Arab population, that like, you know, as long as these authoritarian governments are given the tools they need and, and the support that they need, that they can continue to kind of clamp down on any kind of public uh, dissent or, or unrest, which I think is a bad assumption to make given kind of the history of protest recently in, in the Arab world. But this, the second reason I think partly is racism because they presume that, okay, well, Arabs hate us or Arabs don't like diplomatic recognition of Israel or they have these issues with the occupation, but they're easily led. And once their governments can do X, Y, and Z, they will follow. Um, and it is at its core a racist assumption about Arab political culture and, and, and you know, where people get their opinions from. And so, yeah, I don't think they care. I think they fully understand that Arabs find this very 
um, you know, unpopular and detestable. But uh, that's that's the you know that's the that's what that's the game they're playing is that they're trying to make these alliances with with political leadership to try to you know clamp down on public dissent for many years to come. Yeah, and and it's amazing that in spite of that, I think you. Uh, you have the new government, essentially. I mean, one of the top uh, objectives of the way Mr. Netanyahu, only a few minutes uh, after the swearing ceremony uh, in the Knesset uh, of his new government, it took him a few minutes uh, to, to tweet uh, his objectives. And normalization with the, you know certain Arab countries that haven't normalized yet was on top of his list. Uh, and he, he doesn't ask, uh, how come 80 plus, 84% on average of Arab society doesn't want to normalize with him? And he could care less. Uh, he thinks it's doable and he's going to pursue it. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Zainab Waba. I am a um, Fulbright Humphrey Fellow at American University, and I'm, um, I work at the Human Rights Ministry in Morocco. I would like to know, you mentioned that you had partner institutions in the countries, Paul. So what type of institutions are those? Are there like any public universities? Are, more, are, there, are they more from the private sector? And I also have a question regarding your last uh, comment, then who cares? Um, do you have any idea of like who uses this, your poll, for example, the AOI, for example, who uses uh, that? Uh, is it taken into consideration, for example, in making any Arab policies in the Arab world, for example. Thank you. So I'll answer the first question about uh, regional partners. It depends on the country. So sometimes they are polling firms that work pr uh, primarily with academics. Um, so they work with the barometer, they work with other kinds of uh, survey um, projects. And sometimes it is with institutes, research institutes. So like our partner in Iraq is a research institute. Um, in other places it's, uh, yeah, just it, it really depends on the country. So sometimes it is embedded within a university, and sometimes not. Um, in terms of like, you know, who cares? Well, I, I mean, I care. <laughs> um, I care. I think we should all care. And when we don't even document what Arabs are thinking and what Arabs perceive about the world, then we're just making an assumption that it doesn't matter. But I think that it does matter for understanding the region, understanding regional trends, understanding future instability and conflict. And so that documentation is part of the process of making sure these kinds of, this kind of information comes to light. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I'm, I'm fine with that. But let us, uh, we're running out of time, oh, unfortunately, sorry. and we have quite a few questions left. But let me just conclude with one more uh, questions, uh, question uh, from uh, Fadi, uh, Fadi Hailani. Thank you, Fadi, for your question. Uh, it's an important question. You mentioned uh, that the Saudi respondents didn't answer questions related to normalization uh, with Israel. How would you assess then the reliability of their answers to questions like their trust of the state or state institutions or military institutions? No, absolutely. I think that is a very valid question. So on the question, I'll, be, I'll try to be really brief, but on the Saudi sample, in previous years, when we saw that there was a high non-response rate about Palestine or a high non-response rate about like Israel-Palestine, you know, issues, um, what we did was we um, did something called the list experiment, and so we asked half of the sample to list the you know uh, the number of um, topic areas that were important to them without specifying which ones, and we included Palestine on that list. And in the, in the second half of the sample, we didn't include Palestine. And we were able to see that actually, uh, you know, the Saudis do find Palestine an important topic to them. They just won't name it. But if they'll give, you know, they'll give you a number about it. Um, and so we were able to kind of use those kind of roundabout ways to figure out like that it is a sensitive question, but it's not for lack of care or apathy. Um, but in terms of other questions and how that bleeds in, you're absolutely right. Like, it's why when we see the ability, for example, a question like the ability to criticize a government, um, the Saudi sample um, will have like low scores, but then the ability, or sorry, um, their assessment of their country's democracy, somehow Saudi Arabia ranks very highly there. So the, you can tell like that is a response bias. It's not because they actually think Saudi Arabia is a democracy. And so, that, you know, 
all of that is taken into consideration when we're doing the data analysis part. Um, and that's why I think the expansion into kind of more experimental methods would be really useful. All right, that's the Arab Opinion Index 2022. Thank you so much for being here in person. And thank you to hundreds of people who uh, joined us uh, online uh, and to others who will be watching this over the next uh, few days. Uh, we're in touch. Uh, you stay in touch. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>